to set the scene, uh, we've had a bit of a, a look around to try and sort of get an idea of what patriotic fervour was like in the First World War. Now, I was fossing around on YouTube and uh, discovered there's a little film clip that goes for 10 minutes on YouTube of three events in Borough in 1915 which have been spliced together for the Belgian Flag Day, Australia Day and Anzac Day. Well, it was actually a Cheer Up Society Day in, in uh, October 1915, but it was actually the first Anzac Day it turned out to be. So we've just selected a little piece out of that, and I'll get to Ian to set that going. Here we are, with the young boys. Get the coppers out of their pocket and hand them over for charity. Uh, the three girls here are button, the button girls, and uh, they're a very, very important part of the story of charity buttons uh, sellers in World War I. Every town had a group of button girls. This is a part of the crowd. Uh, we're in Market Square in Burren, and as it swings around there to give an idea of the number of people who turned up to these. Imagine these people at the door or Oval or below the town hall in Murray Street, and it'd be a fairly typical sight of the day. And in a moment, we'll get uh, some scenes of a chap conducting an auction. And auctions in the day. Yeah, piece of film spliced in. Uh, some more button girls here in the front, you can see them and they've got trays sort of slung around their neck which had all the goodies up for sale in them. And uh, the same ones with the girls with the bonnets with the ribbons in were all, were all button sellers. Borough had about 40 button sellers in there and about two weeks after Anzac Day in 1915 they actually put all their horses Road horses, and then, uh, that's the end of the bit that we've cut out from the 10 minute. There's a 10 minute film, and you can find it on YouTube. Just do a search for Borough 1915, and it should come up. So, we'll be done with that. So, we'll get on to the presentation proper with, with the buttons. You want to just hit slideshow if you don't do it from it. Sure, thank you. And uh, as I said, there's a, an, auctions were held in there as well. That particular auction at Borough on the day raised £1,600. And they used to run auctions on what they used to call the bugler system. I still don't understand what the bugler system is. Uh, I've seen two explanations. Uh, one is that people would bid on an item and then don't donate it back and it would be sold again. And then the next buyer would donate it back and it would be sold again. And you see all these wonderful tales about, you know, children donating their pet lambs for auction and they'd be auctioned five times and the final buyer would actually give it back to the kids to take back home and get things like this. So, so anything to raise, raise a bond. Uh, these little buttons, uh, very, very um, popular in South Australia at the time. Many, many of them, hundreds of, there's hundreds of different designs of these buttons for World War One. For, for Gaula, there's got to be 50 of them, different ones. Um, but uh, when you get to uh, the later stages of the war, Australia Day 1918, Australia Day 1919, there may be a hundred different buttons just for that one day. There'd be official buttons and there'd be buttons put out by shops and companies and firms and things like that to be put them through. So we'll work through these. Um, the first charity days, I will go through firstly with what are charity buttons. So what are the buttons? The buttons are, as you can see, on my appropriately um, uh, decorated shirt. Uh, they're little small tin plate buttons. Most of them uh, were made in a 32mm diameter. So there'd be a, a base of the button which had a pin in the back. You can see the, you can see the, the pin on this one, um, showing the rear of it. And then on top of that, there would be a piece or another small piece of tin with paper pattern design on top of that and then that would all be encased in the celluloid and then the whole lot would be clamped onto a, another button for a particular machine. There's two types of buttons. Um, there's also a, a brass one, which is the, the deluxe version. So if the tin plate one sold for a shilling, the deluxe one used to sell for about two and six, but there were lots of other prices charged for these things at the day. Um, the collectors nowadays, we call them tinnies or pinbacks. And uh, in Australia, um, they were made as in quantities for a few hundred for a local event, to as much as 20,000 for a statewide event, and as much as 100,000 for a national event. 
Um, Atkinson and Co, who were one of the Adelaide makers in the 1930s, uh, broke all records when they made 300,000 buttons for a Victoria Hospital in Peel. So we were big business in the day. The, um, as the war progressed, button collecting got more and more popular. So the first buttons were usually come out just one design. But later on, there could be five, six, seven, eight different designs of buttons for a particular event. And then they would also do deluxe buttons and limited edition buttons and other sorts of souvenirs, some of which they charged a guinea for. So you can have buttons going from threepence for a, con for a cardboard badge up to a guinea for a particular item. And in a couple of slides, we'll show you what a guinea was worth. Uh, the next slide, who made them? Right, so there were three major manufacturers in World War I, so it's Atkinson and Co who were in Lee Street here in Adelaide, A.W. Patricks who were in Melbourne, but they, are, they also own open branches here in Adelaide at Unley and in Sydney. Uh, Stokes, who are more, probably more popularly known as metal makers <coughs> in Sydney. Uh, Sharpens Printers a, was a small printer making buttons. Uh, Lee Rule and Co was another one, and they merged with Sharpens a bit later. Schlanks was a jeweller, and they made the high value buttons. That, uh, <clears throat> they charge so much for. Uh, PJ King in Melbourne is another small <coughs> one there. The, the designs of the buttons were usually done by in house commercial <coughs> artists working for all of these printers. <coughs> or, or towns could send you know, designs that they wanted to see on the button and they would, they would do that for them as well. I've yet to find anywhere what they charged for designing buttons or what they, the wholesale price of buttons are. Um, so. It's proving a bit elusive that one, but it's on my list of things to find out. And uh, South Australia was mentioned it's regarded by the present day collectors as, as the most prolific issuers of buttons in Australia at the time. So, next up, we have a piece of artwork. Um, this I discovered whilst I was actually researching this, this talk. There was a, there's a, an archive in the State Library. It's actually Oh, Dora Whitford, but all of this artwork was done before she was married, and her name then was Dora Nichols. And she was a fairly uh, good student at the Adelaide College of Arts. She worked for Atkinson's, and uh, if you look at the newspapers, that she was actually exhibited in the Society of Arts exhibitions, and, uh, and was actually noted in the paper as a capable designer of buttons and painter of plates, so ceramic plates, so she would paint designs on plates. Uh, she married a fellow student, Ken Whitford, in 1926. And in 1934, they gave up all of their artwork and uh, went and bought some scrub land down at Maiponga and turned it into a dairy farm, which is still going today. Uh, but the couple retired in the 1960s, I think it was, and they did actually return to their artwork. And the two of them published together a, uh, a book on line drawing and etching, and both making etch prints. So the next slide, about the values. The Reserve Bank has a wonderful little website that tells you, you know, what, what a pound in 1916 is worth today. So we, we've done this here. So a pound, a 1915 pound in 2021 is 108 bucks worth. So um, a guinea being one pound one shilling, which is equivalent to $2.10, it would now be worth $113. So you can imagine what the donation that people were giving at the time. As I mentioned before, the most common buttons were sold at a shilling. So for 1915, that was $5.40 nowadays. So it's probably a fairly typical amount that people might donate $5 to a button, button collection or something now. Uh, so I don't know. I think a, a sausage at Bunnings is probably still cheaper than that. So it's, it's quite good. Uh, but there must have been a considerable devaluation of currency in 1918 and 1919 where we see that a shilling then is only worth $4.17 in 1919. So it's dropped 20% from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. But uh, that's just to give you an idea of what sorts of figures were being donated at the time. Uh, the little film of Borough that we showed you earlier that day, uh, Borough <laughs> raised £2,200 on, on that day. Uh, Gawler on the for the same event raised two thousand pounds. Uh, so uh, pretty big events. Uh, the sale of buttons, it was almost a free for all at the beginning, and so lots of people were running these campaigns um, to to raise money, and there must have been some people who were doing things 
on the sly and they were probably pocketing the money rather than kind of gathering it for a war fund. So in 1916, the government, and I think all the governments in all the Australian states um, passed legislation and here in South Australia it's called the War Funds Regulation Act of 1916 and then all button days had to be registered with, this, with what was called the State War Council and then they would approve them and they would also schedule them so they don't get on too many all at once and they were trying to aim for one a month. Right in. Next one. Now, having made all these buttons, because I need people to sell them, and generally they were, they were young ladies, <coughs> usually single ladies and girls, and often married ladies as well, who uh, ended up with the jobs of organising these things and helping out as well. Um, photographs of these ladies are incredibly difficult to find. Uh, State Library website had about six, I think, in their collection, all in Adelaide. And uh, this is one of the Adelaide ones for uh, buy, buy a button day to raise funds for the Myrtle Bank Soldiers Home. And the buttons that were sold in Adelaide were also sold in Gawler, so it's slightly appropriate. And that's a typical garb, uh, usually a white dress, and bonnet, and a tray of buttons out, or a clicking tin as well. A part of the State War Council's regulations that all the, the things had to be audited, so they went from just you know, a loose trade to proper collecting tins that were sealed so that the people couldn't uh, uh, help themselves. <coughs> in uh, Gawler, uh, I started making a list of button sellers, but when it got over 100, I stopped. So there was a lot of them. Uh, one lady's name that kept coming up was a lady called Margaret Patterson, um, who seemed to be a fairly prominent family in Gawler, but at the end of the war they actually left Gawler because I found the newspaper reports of a, a social given for that departure. Uh, another lady who towards the end of the war appeared in nearly every list of volunteer button girls was a lady called uh, uh, Trixie McConnell. Uh, many of you who will, will remember her, I guess. Right, the Belgian flag days is the next one again. The very first flag day um, was a suggestion of the governor of the day, uh, Henry Galway, who <coughs> noted that the 8th of April 1915 was King Albert's 40th birthday. Now, Belgium uh, was doing it pretty rough at the beginning of the year because they resisted the German occupation, um, had most of their crops wiped out, and basically they had a famine in Belgium at the time. <coughs> and the British government decided they were going to help them out with food and other supplies. And they were allocating millions of pounds a month to do that. And what they did is they called upon all the empire countries and they asked Australia to uh, contribute 100,000 pounds a month to the, to the Belgian fan, uh, fund. And so here in Australia, they all found ways to raise the money. This appears to be the first flag day as such, selling the souvenir things. Um, Newspaper reports of the day, as I said, the quantities that were reported went from 20,000 to 50,000. It was initially an Adelaide only selling event, but the leftovers were often in country towns. I found examples of Mount Gambia Borough that we've just seen in Narracor uh, were all recorded in the papers of having Belgian flag days. And uh, but I haven't found one yet for Gawler, but I won't discount it at this stage because Gawler was up with those towns in size and would be quite likely to be asked to come to that cause. Um, the actual Adelaide flag has the monogram of King Albert and his birth date on it. Now this is actually a British one, but it's the closest thing I could find to it. I've never seen an Adelaide version showing the monogram. <coughs> uh, the next one is purely a South Australian uh, innovation, Violet Day. Uh, <coughs> Violet Day was um, devised by the, what was known as the Cheer Up Society, which was, uh, they ran a sort of a comforts home in Adelaide, known as the Cheer Up Hut, which was about where the Festival Theatre now is. And so they would feed and entertain and give recreation to, uh, to uh, soldiers as they were preparing to uh, go to war or returning from war. And uh, the silk ribbons were actually the first types of uh, buttons that came out, and but they had a long history before World War One. <coughs> very rare. This is a picture I found from a button uh, badge that's in the History Trust collection. Uh, he, uh, because they're silk, uh, they deteriorate very quickly. And I think surviving examples would be very rare. 
and even rare in good condition. Uh, one thing I did note with those is that uh, 30,000 of those were made and for 10,000 were sent to Gawler for sale and they sold all of them and they raised, as I said, 48 pounds, 10 shillings, as you can see on the screen. Uh, one of the more interesting uh, topics that came out of that when sales of the day were reported in the Adelaide papers, the sellers at the Adelaide railway station complained that everyone that came arrived on the Gawler train already had their ribbon. Because the local girls got them at the Gawler station before they got on the train. <laughs> right, now the button day, the next slide, is this little one that I'm wearing here. It uh, actually was devised in Melbourne. Uh, there was a chap called Mr Tucker who was uh, in the uh, Patriotic League in Colac, decided that, well, he suggested that buttons be made. And that suggestion got picked up by the, the Governor and Governor-General in Victoria. So they formed a fundraising committee based around having button days. And uh, they formed a Commonwealth Button Fund. And that fund organised 33 button days over the war. And the sale of buttons is, uh, is there. £265,000 they raised for those buttons. <coughs> the first buttons produced were for the Belgian Relief Fund. And they were sold at a shilling each. You'll see that this it was actually a small one there. The uh, first button day was in Melbourne, <coughs> on Empire Day, that's the 24th of May. Uh, they clearly either had leftover buttons or made more buttons so the thing could be repeated in other towns around the country. So in Adelaide, on the next slide, Ian, we have the button day which was held on the 16th of July 1915 and these are the first buttons I have a record of being sold in South Australia and also here in Gawler. Uh, they had only 400 buttons sent to Gawler for sale and they all sold out quickly and uh, they raised £21.14 shillings against £20 worth of buttons and how do they get a little bit extra? Uh, they attach a bit of ribbon they, they might ask for an extra penny to pin it on somebody's label for them, you know. All, all the feminine wiles they would use to get a little bit extra for money for these, these things. I'm saying nothing's new. <laughs> yes. So that was the first button day. In uh, Melbourne, they sold a button with a white. Edge. I don't think that was sold here in Adelaide. They made 50,000 of them and they sold out in Melbourne. And they were to be purchased by people who actually had family members serving in the forces to, to, to distinguish those. And they were also quite aware of you know, fake button sellers. So they had a, a badge there with a number on that official button sellers wore to indicate that they were the real deal. So the next event was uh, Australia Day in July 1915. They, this one returned back to the, the silk ribbons. Once again, this is a very, very difficult ribbon to find. I, I don't have one. I don't even recall seeing a real one, to be honest. So this is from the Australian War Memorial Collection. And uh, it's definitely the item because it's described in the newspapers, so there's no doubt in that. The Australia Day was held here in Gawler, and they sold all of these things here. Some of the other things that they made for sale uh, was... Um, uh, the Adelaide Arts and Crafts Society and the School of Arts actually treated gum leaves and painted designs on gum leaves and sold those as charity events. Uh, I've never seen one of those. <laughs> you can imagine that the survival rate of those is very, very small. But even so, even with the silk badges and other things that were made for sale, they still raised £91 selling those things here in Gordon, which is a pretty fair effort. The next slide comes from that day. <coughs> <coughs> That's the next one. No, you're going backwards. Yep. Yep. Next one. That's the one. This is a part of the Australia Day procession in Gawler. Uh, Australia Day was actually nominated for the 30th of July, which was a Friday, and they had a lot, most of the events were in Adelaide. Gawler actually held theirs over two days, and they had their procession on the 31st, so that a lot of the things that were in Adelaide could come to Gawler be shown here as well. However, the, the, lorry, the lorry there is uh, owned by one of the locals and the staff of the Hutchinson Hospital dress that up as a field ambulance, so they're all staff and nurses at Hutchinson in the back of the lorry there. And then stood there in the corner on the steps of the Institute 
Um, and we've blown that up here as much as I possibly can. Uh, the local button sellers, and that's the only image I know of the locals you know, selling buttons. You know, I'd love to find a better one and a close up one, that one featuring Margaret Patterson and Trips and Colin, that'd be really nice. But uh, the hunt is still on. Now, in this one here, as I said, there, Gawler contributed £2,200. What the governments of the day did was they used to set a target to be raised by each fund. The state target for that fund was £100,000 for Australia Day, all, all the towns combined. <coughs> and Gawler was set a target of £1,000. They actually raised £2,200 and the state raised a quarter of a million pounds. So it was an extremely well supported event at the time. Uh, the next one, Memorial Day. The ribbons that were sold for Violet Day were offered again for Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day was set aside for all the Gordon churches to hold services to remember the, the fallen um, in Gora. So, right. Now the next lot of buttons we have on offer, and I believe these are the first South Australian design buttons that were sold here in Gora, but for the Wotton Day League, uh, the Wattle Day League tend to specialise in raising funds for field ambulances and they made buttons in these two sizes as it was here. So the small ones they sold for sixpence, the large ones for a shilling. The sixpence buttons were really <coughs> intended for, uh, for children to buy, so they spent a bit of pocket money on those. Uh, a thousand buttons uh, were sold in Gawler, raising £29, but I don't know the split between sixpenny and shilling buttons. Wattle Day later became prominent too as uh, memories for soldiers and planting wattle trees and the like, which we'll come to later. French Flag Day is the next one. Uh, this was actually organised to be held in July, but uh, when uh, the Belgian Button Fund came in, they postponed it, and it was a, a joint effort between uh, Alliance Francaise and the South Australian government selling these buttons. And uh, here in Gawler, uh, £28 worth was sold by the, the Cheer Up Girls, who were all the volunteers working for the, cheer up, the local branch of the Cheer Up Society. Uh, and then the next one, the Lady Mayor, Mrs Cox, here in Gawler, set up a motor ambulance fund for, for Gawler to raise money for a, buy an ambulance. So they had a, their first button day in October 1915, and they sold the school ambulance button, which is a, a small one, and they sold them a sixpence each. Um, they had another day the following year, but this first one raised £17. <coughs> then in November, we come to the Cheer Up Button Day, which is the next one. Now, the Cheer Up Society was formed in uh, early 1915, but it was really already doing works in, uh, in late 1914. And this uh, event in November 1915 was actually sort of declared as being their first birthday. And it was also coincided with the opening of the Cheer Up Hut in, in Adelaide. And so funds were raised by Cheer Up Branch was all over the state. And I mentioned you saw the borough Cheer Up Girls earlier. Well, there was 40 of them with their horses, got on the train, went down to Adelaide at their own expense, and uh, rode in the procession in the streets raising money and so proud were the people of Borough of their girls that they actually raised, the, raised some money to reimburse them. So I'm sure to send 40 horses on a train to Borough to Adelaide and back again wouldn't have been cheap. Uh, when the Cheer Up Hut was opened, the Attorney General responded to the speeches and he, he mentioned if all the buttons that had been sold in the past 12 months were collected, there would be sufficient to pave King William Street. And I think by the end of the war there would have been sufficient to pave all the streets of Adelaide. <laughs> Those. Now the YMCA, it was the next button day, it was in December 1915, they, their first button day had two designs, and, uh, here they are, but they were also in both sizes, six pence and shooting buttons. <coughs> the button there with the bulldog on sold out very quickly and then it was changing hands on the same day for as much as a pound for, for the button collectors to get the bulldog in, uh, so quite remarkable. The supplies of these were sent to Gawler and sold by the Cheer Up Girls again, raising £36, so it was another good effort by them. Uh, in Adelaide, the button day was the 26th of November, um, and what they organised then was the country towns to have their days on different days so they didn't clash, and in Gawler, 17th of December. 
So you will see all these dates relate to when they were sold in Norway, but there may be other advertisements that you might see showing different dates. So we move into 1916, and the first button day there was in February, once again, for uh, the Ambulance Fund. Uh, this seems to be the only other school or ambulance specific um, fund day that was done. And uh, later in 1916, uh, the Ambulance Fund got together with uh, the Red Cross, the Kiwi Knitting Club, the Knitting League, uh, the Cheer Up Society and the St Andrew's Presbyterian Church had their own fundraising group, pulled all their monies together and that got enough money to get a motor ambulance and that was presented to uh, Lady Galway on a visit in May. Then we have a gap then to June 1916, where the Gawler Red Cross had a button day, which was part of the statewide appeal uh, to raise funds, and it was the first time the Red Cross actually had button days in uh, South Australia. Uh, There's a special one button was done, and they were sold in Gawler by members of the Red Cross Society who uh, called themselves the Guard of Honour, and they would go around and hassle people to get their money. And this particular button day was raising money for uh, the Mariba Hospital, which is was down in Woodville, so I presume that's been taken up by Woodville Hospital now. £40 was raised from selling just the one design button, which is a very good effort. Then we come to the 1916 Australia Day, so the next one. Once again, the organisers of Australia Day have set aside dates in each capital city to have an Australia Day celebration, and here in South Australia, it was the 28th of July, and that was Australia Day in Adelaide, but they asked all the country towns to pick another day in July to have mm -hmm. their Australia Day, and Gawler picked theirs on the 29th. Once again, I think it was so that he get some of the attractions that were in Adelaide the day before up here to Gawler, and uh, get more people to the procession, and more people to uh, fork out some money. They had the two designs there, so the first one with the date on it is the Adelaide one, and the other one is the one that was sold in all the other country towns around the state. And uh, once again, large and small, and sixpence were shilling each. And, uh, and 85 pounds raised for the Wounded Soldiers Fund. 1916 Violet Day was the next one. And for this year, they had buttons in two sizes. And uh, once again, uh, sold by the Cheer Up Hills here, raised 50 pounds. And that money would have gone to fund the Cheer Up Hut. And in 1916, we have some mysteries. As I said, the next slide shows us what I had but didn't know about and still don't know about, despite all the research I've done in the last month. So we know from newspaper reports that the Red Cross Society sold buttons on Wattle Day, which in 1916 was on the 1st of September. They also sold buttons at the Gawler Show, but we don't know what they look like either. Uh, there was a carnival at the Gawler Institute on the 7th and 8th of December, where buttons were also reported to have been sold. I don't know what they look like. And uh, there was a Cheer Up Society had a local band of performers <coughs> called the Reverence, and uh, had a, a concert that they did at the Institute. They sold buttons at the, during the, the interval. don't know what they look like either. Now, a couple of candidates is the Wattle Day League one, maybe the one that was sold at Wattle Day. That's the state design button. And the lower one is has Red Cross Carnival across the top and shows a picture of Hutchinson Hospital. It could be 1916, but I think it's more likely to be another carnival they had the following year. But I think it's again. More research is needed. We may, we may never know the actual answer. <coughs> right, then we move to Repatriation Day. 1916, soldiers are starting to come back and they need to have, you know, assistance to get back into society, assistance with housing, assistance with finding jobs, etc. And so buttons were sold then to raise money for those purposes. And uh, in Gawler, here we are. Interestingly, they had an expense, line. they must have bought buttons, um, which is different to all the other earlier ones where buttons were sent and sold and they just sent the money back. So they must have bought buttons and then sent back the proceeds. They're 23 pounds there. Then, we move on to 1917, where we now have what I think is the first Gawler design button, except maybe for that Red Cross one, uh, for Repatriation Carnival held here on the 10th of March. Uh, once again, big procession, big, big events at the Gawler Oval, and 
in here, the buttons were sold by the Committee for the Australian Soldiers Repatriation Fund. Uh, because they had their own button designed, uh, they actually purchased that six pounds <coughs> worth and sold, sold them for 21 pounds. So the, money, the difference in the money went to the uh, repatriation fund. Anzac Day. Anzac Day in 1917, the, to the 25th of April as we know it now. And the Cheer Up Society sold, money, uh, sold buttons for the Returned Soldiers and Sailors Association. Uh, these two buttons are described in the newspapers, so I'm, I'm certain these are the ones that were sold on that uh, particular uh, appeal. And the, uh, the, the gentleman on the, uh, the button on the right hand side is General Birdwood, who was described in the newspapers of the day. Uh, the 1917 Violet Day is the next one. And I'll mention that all these newspaper clippings are all from the Gaul of Bunyip, and so just a bit of proof on here. Uh, there were several Three designs of buttons were done for the 1917 Violet Day, but this is the only one I've found with the actual date on it, so I'm presuming the others don't have a date on them or uh, they yet to be still seen. So, so this is the one here. Then we come to another Australia Day, this time in August 1917. Unusually, it said the 11th of August was when it was held in Gaul, it was supposed to be in July. And when the committee was formed to set a date, they looked at July and said, well, we've got sports carnivals on that weekend, we've got this on that weekend, we've got this on that weekend. July was the full, so they waited until August. This is another button which I'm attributing to this event because it's, I won't say common, it's, it's fairly pl a plentiful button to find among the collectors with a cute doll on it. Um, it just says good luck, Gaul in 1917 on it, so it may or may not be for Australia Day, uh, but I think it is uh, for that one because that was the, the largest event of the year and as I said, it's the most plentiful button, so it makes sense that it would have been on that particular occasion there, particularly when you see that they raised £94 from selling them, so it would have been a lot of buttons, and they had an expense of £14 uh, getting them made for Australia Day. Uh, um, also, now in, we're starting to see private buttons being made, so also on the next one here, <coughs> this shows the benefit of uh, having things on different dates. Now, the South Australian Railways had, used to decorate locomotives and then exhibit them at different towns where they used to go. So, once again, the South Australian Railways decorated a locomotive and they brought that up to Gawler actually displayed it in Murray Street. So took the locomotive into Murray Street and charged people to go and inspect it and of course sold buttons to uh, go to the event. And uh, the other button was the stock standard Australia Day button that was issued across South Australia in uh, 1917. Uh, the next one is the next Wattle Day. Uh, there was a Wattle Grove somewhere on the Gawler Oval, or around the Gawler Showgrounds. We're not precisely sure which. Uh, I know Helen's been trying to research this. We think it's where the netball courts now are, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll happily be corrected on that if that's wrong. And so this was the second year where wattle trees were planted for Gawler's fallen soldiers. So sadly, 39 trees were added to the ones that were in the wattle grove. And they sold buttons on the day, 27 pounds was raised. There is a description of the button in the papers it matches this one, but this is a button that was produced by that Melbourne Commonwealth Button Fund and that was sold across Australia. And for those larger buttons they used to sell them at two and six, so that could explain why they managed to sell £27 worth. So once again, not certain on that, but it's sort of a 90% certain attribution that that was the button sold here on that day. Then we come to another YMCA appeal, and this time we have four buttons and a badge. So by 1917 the button collectors are really getting into it and people are now trying to click every button that's been issued as collectors. So it's not, nothing to do with patriotism, it's building a collection of buttons. And uh, these were three that were done here in, uh, designed actually here in South Australia. Now Angus and Wall, the South Australian designers, uh, Wall um, actually worked for the Department of Lands of the, go the Government Photolithographer, so you'll see his names on maps and things that the Government printed. Uh, he also designed some duty stamps for the South Australian Government, so, so he was a pretty good one. 
with these buttons were made by crowds in Sydney and sold a shilling, shilling for the little ones and two shillings for the normal sized ones now. And Gerard Bills raised £57. So they were the three designs that were done. The advanced sales for these were so great that they actually had to get a fourth button made pretty quickly, and that's on the next slide, uh, the one with the coat of arms on. Uh, probably not designed by Angus and Wall, but uh, just something to make up the numbers. And for the first time, this is where we also see a, a deluxe badge being made. So that's an, an enamelled badge which they used to sell at five shillings each compared to two shillings and buttons. So I was quite fortunate enough to find one of those on eBay so I could get a picture of it. So it was good. <laughs> then we move to September 1917 when we have a Red Cross button day. Once again, the concept is button collectors out there. Let's feed them. And uh, for this button day, they issued five buttons. Um, the Critic, which was a newspaper of the day, wrote, knowing the keen competition that exists now among button collectors, the wily originators have decided to issue five official buttons, a series of four, that's cuteness for you, and a poor solitary button for the poor of purse. So the one here with the flags and the allies. Interestingly, September 17, we've got the American flag is in there by now. Uh, we then, then move on to Navy Day. Uh, several buttons were done for Navy Day as well, and, sent, and they were sent, supplies were sent up here to be sold by the Cheer Up Girls. £23 raised selling those here in Gawler. Uh, there's another one for the day after, which was Nelson's birthday, Nelson Day, which was quite an attractive design, but I'm not sure that they were sold up here. Then we come to the next Red Cross Carnival in November 1917. I'll put those two buttons up there because I think, I think they both connect with this carnival. Uh, but once again, I'm not sure. Now, the Red Cross Carnival, when it was being organised, um, decided to have a, a Kings and Queens competition and there was a, a King of Industry competition was held. So these competitions were made a lot like the, like the charity beauty competitions of the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Uh, so they were beauty quests, but really they were all about raising charity. So in those days they had the blokes doing it as well, and the King of Industry was later named to be Alf May of May Brothers. So I'm suspecting this was a button that was made before the carnival and sold as part of his fundraising activities to become the King of Industry. And I'm suspecting that the button with the red uh, for the Red Cross Carnival with Hutchinson Hospital is for this November 1917 Carnival. Once again, absolutely not certain, but 90% certain. Uh, I've also noted on there that the Red Cross meeting in September acknowledged receipt of a parcel of buttons from Mrs May. So I'm just wondering whether that was that one. And that was seven weeks before the <coughs> Carnival. Right. Yeah, the Cheer Up Society is now having its third birthday and once again they issued six different button designs. Uh, five of them I know what they look like and three of them are there and one I don't know what it looks like. Uh, the interesting one in this little group there is the, the, the gentleman there from the inventory, hats off to the inventory. Uh, he is a gentleman called Lieutenant Leslie Boyce who was with the 27th and 10th Battalions. Uh, he was wounded in Pozieres in 1916, came back to South Australia and took up a position with the State Recruitment Committee and he was probably the state's number one recruiter of soldiers. In a single visit to Roseworthy one day, he signed up 24 people. So it yes, uh, must have been very persuasive, yes, so quite remarkable. So they, fe they featured him on one of this series of buttons. The next one uh, was... Uh, Red Letter Button Day. This was done to raise funds for um, a wing at Keswick Hospital, which was in, next to the, the Army Barracks there at Keswick. Uh, this was also done by the Wattle Day League. They also had numerous buttons and also the more expensive souvenirs. And uh, luckily the State Library has a very nice collection that they've digitised. You can view on their State Library's website. And, uh, they had one of the silver WDALF, that's Model Day League Ambulance Fund, a um, little silver pin which uh, was sold at uh, five shillings each. We also had one at Bulldog that was also five shillings, but not found a picture of that one yet. Uh, so quite attractive. 
And then we come to another organisation which like to issue lots of different button designs. Uh, this is the Myrtle Bank Soldier Sun. And uh, so the first series there, Faith, Hope and Love, which is quite an attractive set of buttons. And then a more expensive button there with a Cupid doll. So the three at the top were a shilling each they charged and two and six for the Cupid doll. They were also quite popular, raising 32 pounds here in Gaul. Uh, they also issued a, a Thruppence cardboard batch with Brit on it for the, for the kids to buy. Next, another big group of buttons for the Trench Comforts Fund. Uh, this isn't all of them I'll, I'll add. So there, there are lots of buttons being issued now for particular days. And what you'll start to see is the, the figures raised start to drop off because I think, I think people are thinking, oh, I'm getting taken for a ride here, so they don't have them there. Um, the buttons there, that one's clearly from February 1918 because it's dated. The other three I've attributed to this particular appeal because the later appeal was after the ACF adopted their red star emblem and they're on the later buttons. So the three of them there don't have the red star. Then we have a group we have got next. Uh, these buttons were actually not uh, for a war fund, they were actually buttons done by the comedy company themselves for their own income. So this comedy company were all returned soldiers who used to perform around the state and interstate as well. So to Sergeant Barrett's, uh, this is his new Gallipoli comedy company, he had one the previous year with a different troop in it. And they performed here in Gore on the 27th of February and sold buttons in the during the intervals in their performances. There's the two 1918 buttons, so we know that from this group and not the earlier 1917 group. Next one, there was a big push to get more children involved in collecting money for the, the charities. And I might say legitimately collecting money for the charities, because the, the little tykes used to go out and <laughs> try and raise some money themselves. Uh, but this was far more organised and the, Red Cross did this in conjunction with the Children's Patriotic Fund and did this rather attractive badge um, which was sold in the state between the 1st and 14th of April and here in Gawler, it was on the 5th of April. And uh, they were busy, busy little types, so they raised 59 pounds for selling one shilling buttons, so they did very well. Uh, the next is uh, the Returned Soldiers Association again did this button for uh, to raise money for an RSL home in Adelaide, uh, not, not one here. Uh, I believe it's the only button they did for the, that particular appeal, and it's definitely the one because it's just the Justice Not Charity slogan was attributed to all of the appeals for that one in the Adelaide papers. £22 raised there. Another red triangle day for the uh, Red Cross. Uh, seven buttons were, were produced for this one. Um, but only one was described in the paper, so I don't really know what the other six look like. But this gentleman here, JJ Virgo, was a South Australian. He was the Empire Field Secretary for the YMCA, and two days before this button day, he was actually here in Gordon giving, giving a speech and trying to raise a interest in the fund. So I'm sure that accounts for the £42 worth of buttons that were sold here for that particular appeal. Then we come to the next violent day in 1918. The, here, um, 64 pounds worth of souvenirs were sold there. <coughs> I can't really attribute any buttons to particularly to 1918, but uh, this is one that was described in the paper. So I know this is a 1918 one, but I'm sure there are others. Then we come to the Trench Comfort Shop. Trench Comfort Shop was opened by um, a group who who called themselves the, the League of Loyal Women. And they opened a shop in the local recruiting office, which I think was one of the rooms beneath the town hall. Yeah. Uh, this was there. And uh, they opened the shop in June 1918, but they had their official opening on the 19th of July. Uh, the opening was supposed to have been done by Lady Galway, the governor's wife, uh, but uh, she was unable to attend. So it was opened by a lady called Miss Muriel Farr, who I'd never heard of until I read this newspaper report. So I spent an hour going on one of those tangents on Trove, as you frequently do, and she seemed to be a very impressive young woman. Um, sort of a University of Adelaide graduate in the 1890s, destined to be a school teacher, but went into politics instead. 
but not, not as a politician, but as one of the backroom people. She was a secretary of the uh, Liberal, National Liberal Union. She gave that up to be a founding member of the League of Loyal Women. And uh, they had branches all over the state and raised a lot of money. And uh, for that, she got an OBE in 1918. So that would be very unusual for a miss to be given an OBE in those days. So probably a great candidate for somebody's thesis in the next, next biography, Helen. <laughs> Australia Day 1918. Uh, this is the, the first one where we have some specific designs for Gore. And we have the, 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 the town's coat of arms on these ones here. Um, not, not surprising when you realise that the, the committee for the Australia Day nominated the Mayor and the Town Clerk and the Reverend Best to pick the designs for the buttons for the year. So we have the two, the two different colours of the Gore coat of arms. Uh, the railway workers in the town, not specifically the employees of, of Martins and Perrings and the like, but the people actually worked on the railways in the town, also organised their own button with, with signals and the signal box. And uh, the newspaper reports said that uh, they sold 800 of those, which was a pretty good effort. Yes. Then we come back to the Red Cross Society. They had a, their Red Cross appeal in September, all, all through September 1918. And different, once again, different towns had different days for their button days. Now, the 1918 appeal was actually launched by Lady Galway here in Gawler on the 10th of September. Uh, these are the, the four buttons that were done. So the, the three basic ones and a nice oval shaped one there. Uh, which are <coughs> dearer ones sold at two and six, but very attractive designs. Quite, quite appealing. Really like the one in the middle with the soldier and the nurse. The, uh, Traditionally, the Gawler Red Cross had the rights, sole rights to sell buttons at the Gawler Show, which of course was also in September at the time. And uh, one of the reports of the Red Cross said that prior to the show, they'd sold £27 worth of Red Cross buttons. Then when we come to the Gawler Show, which is the next slide, we find there's two special buttons for the Gawler Red Cross in 1918. One of them is actually inscribed Gawler Show, and the other one there with the cap, which is the one I'm wearing on my pocket here, uh, was the, the two that I believe were sort of sold at the Gawler show in addition to the other four I would expect. And I think when you see that they raised £132 from selling buttons and having a special lunch and teas at the Gawler show, uh, they had a very good uh, success with those. The newspaper reports said that the, the, uh, the button done for the show with the Red Cross on, they included those in 76 parcels of Red Cross socks and handkerchiefs and things one for each of the Gawler people who were serving at the time of the show. The next one, the Myrtle Bank Soldiers Home League, produced probably one of the most attractive sets of buttons um, from the wall. Uh, the Australian birds here. Uh, they weren't giving them away though. Uh, the buttons were two and six um, for the smaller ones, four shillings for this one with the, the two cock twos on and uh, five shillings for the larger one. With the, three pictures I think they are and uh, here we have we've got five lovely design buttons and we find here that the, the sales have dropped to 20 pounds so I think people are starting to get tired of them by now yes. then we move to Navy Day once again lots of uh, different designs were available no record in the paper of uh, what value of buttons were sold but uh, the but it was mentioned in the paper, of course, that they were sold here, so not much more to add to uh, that particular slide than what I've put up there. Then we come to another appeal by the Australian Comforts Fund. So this is the League of Royal Women. Uh, these are described in the paper, so I'm, I'm sure that they are for the November one, and you'll notice that the three buttons around the edge have the star of the ACF in them, and the two deluxe buttons, as they called them, show generals... Uh, uh, Pershing and Allenby, and uh, they were sold them at two and six each. Uh, they raised £140 selling these buttons in Gawler, but when we move to the next slide, we'll, we'll see where a lot of that money was actually raised. Uh, in addition to the buttons, they also did this medallion and the little enamelled ACF badge. The medallion they sold at a guinea, a guinea each, and it's reported in the bunyip that uh, 
Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. May disposed of many guinea designs, so you wouldn't need to get uh, too many of those sold to get to your uh, 140 pounds. And the 1917 guinea is $106 in today's money, so it's still a pretty substantial donation for one of those medallions. Then we have the French Red Cross. Uh, the French Red Cross, um, as I said, there were a lot of appeals to the French Red Cross. This is the biggest one in South Australia, which was in December 1918. Uh, lots of, I think I've seen 20 different button designs in December 1918 for the French Red Cross. Uh, the young lady is uh, the most commonly seen button, so that must have been the, probably the official one. And the, the, the two deluxe buttons in the brass class um, show General Powell. General Powell actually visited Gould a couple of times in 1918, but luckily uh, just a month before this particular appeal. And uh, General Fock and the French, the little inscription there is the French battle cry, they shall not pass, uh, which was adopted uh, after uh, the French General Nouvelle. Uh, exhorted all of his troops not to let the Germans pass in the, the Battle of Verdun in 1916, and that was adopted as that war cry ever since. Uh, the buttons here raised 19 pounds. Then, December 1918, so we're at the end of the war now. Uh, this is the Cheer Up Society. Cheer Up Society state branch allowed all of the local branches around the, the state to organise their own buttons and have their own button day and they were allowed then to keep the funds that they raised. So the local Cheer Up Society got these two buttons made. But here we see you know, the two buttons, Gordon specific, the sales only raised 20 pounds. So I don't know whether that was because all they had made or that was all they had um, managed to sell. Uh, the other thing that may have affected the sales and at this time there were actually newspaper articles uh, really attacking the button sellers and the charities saying that they were retaining a lot of the money that they got and the button sellers were being paid, which was absolutely refuted at the time. We have some more mysteries in 1918. Uh, these three here. So you see once again, a few of buttons for repatriation fund were sold. Not sure what they look like. Once again, buttons were sold for the Wattle Day League, this time on the 31st of August, when war trees were planted and the pergola uh, was, was established in the Wattle Grove at the Gordon Show grounds. And we have these three buttons here, two for the Gawla Knitting League and one for the Cooey Club. The Cooey Club was a sub-branch of the Knitting League, which were, were basically the ladies who taught other ladies how to knit socks and the like. And in fact, I think there was one lady there who could actually knit two pairs of socks, one in each hand at the same time. So that's <laughs> actually very proficient. Yes. Um, so we have those two. I, they may be related to specific events. The, the Knitting League held what they called a frolic at the St George's Hall on the 8th of October in 1918. And uh, the Knitting League also had organised a procession of, of Gawler's women war, war workers, which went from Murray Street to the Gawler Oval, I think down Jacob Street. And uh, they participated in a battalion fate. 16th of November. So they may be associated with that, or they may be just things that they sold through the year, and all the money that they raised they used to buy wood, make more, make more socks, make more handkerchiefs, make more balaclavas, etc. etc. Myrtle Bank Soldiers League again, six buttons this time, um, which was sold around the state. There was a seventh button that they did, but that was only supplied to the only high school students and they sold those because it depicted one of their teachers who had a wing named after him at the soldier's home. And we see six designs here, sales going down to £25. The repatriation carnival in 1919, so now we're getting the troops coming back and big carnivals were held all around the state as to, to welcome the troops home. Here in Gawla, it was on the 29th of March, they did this series of buttons, which are usually the ones that are most commonly found you know, when you're sort of looking at second-hand shops and the like for Gawler. 
they uh, the sales for these 52 pounds, but they cost 36 pounds to get made, so they didn't make much of a profit on those. Probably because they had so many different designs of them, and they had a, a, a deluxe version as well of the Britannia um, writing on the wall, which I think, which is writing I will repay on the wall, and uh, that one also has issues of the plain button as well. Once again, the Gawler Railway. Uh, staff made their own button. I think this is another one of those Dora Atkinson designs because they read the file of artwork that she had and it depicts what they called the, a Commonwealth, the, a Commonwealth locomotive uh, which would be made for carriers at the time. Yeah, so, I those. Um, the button with the train I've also seen used for the Warrior Railway Day. So, just to show if those designs were picked out books probably. Red Triangle Appeal for 1919. This was another big uh, set of buttons for the collectors to uh, indulge in. Five different designs. Uh, so they had two buttons at a shilling each, a button at two shillings, um, a badge at five shillings and a badge at a guinea. Uh, so the three there, the, um, the, the end one is the two shilling one. No different in sort of design or structure to the others. It was probably just made in a smaller number. It's a limited edition. And then the other two at a shilling each. So we look at how much the sales are dropping out. 14 pounds for, for these. When we move on to the next slide, we'll see the two dear ones. Uh, the, the one with the, the, the globe and the red triangle. They were sold at a guinea each. But the, uh, the surrounding border was in one carat gold. So probably one of the most expensive produced buttons that were done in the war and the other one's a badge there and uh, a newspaper advertisement from the Adelaide papers uh, because the button day in Adelaide was on the 23rd of May which might be another reason why the sales in Gord were a bit low because people may have gone to Adelaide with their buttons and didn't need to buy them the following week and we move on to 1919 Violet Day which was the last appeal by the Cheer Up Society once again, multiple designs of buttons. Uh, there's just three of them there. And you can see there that they did five, five shilling buttons, a five shilling button, which I think is the one in the middle there, and two shilling pin, which was just a, it was a violet cross on a pin, which they also sold. Uh, 30 pounds worth of sales, which you can see is less than half of what they sold the previous year. So once again, uh, interest is declining. Then we have a peace day button. Sorry, skip page. Red Cross appeal in June 1919. Once again, two specific, distinctive Gawler designs. I, I love the top one. I mean, that's my, my, my favourite one of the lot. The locally designed buttons for the, the war. No, no, um, no doubt about those because they're described in newspaper advertisements. But once again. Only raised £24 and there's no mention of how much they cost. Uh, there should have been a mention of how much they cost because that was part of the regulations from that uh, State War Council's uh, job. So that may still be found. Peace Day is the next one. These buttons were sold for the Return Soldiers and Sailors uh, Association. So th this is a bit more popular, £37 raised for this one, which is pretty good because it was only the one design done. and. Uh, the Return Soldiers Association allowed the local sellers to retain 25% of their proceeds and they donated that to the Adelaide Chiro Hunt. Once again, all above board, they didn't take any money. Getting now to the end of 1919, this is purely a Return Soldiers celebration that was at Gawler Oval. Um, they had a sports carnival and a war exhibition. Uh, so they asked the Return Soldiers to show some of the things they brought back. There was actually a special class of displays of these buttons that the locals had collected, but it was a disaster. Uh, they, was a, the whole event was designed to raise money for a local RSL hall, and I think many of you will be aware of the saga of that thing there, which went for years, and it raised the whole function, not just button sales, but the, the entire function, less than £100. When you compare that to three years earlier when the Australia Day function raised over £2,000. Uh, the returning soldiers were very um, circumspect about it all and basically they just, just wrote it off and said 
the war is over, everybody's moving on, and they don't care about us anymore, uh, which, which may have been true, certainly not true nowadays, but it was probably true at the time. So, that was those. And, and two of the more tougher buttons to find. Now, I'll finish with the Gawler South Soldiers Memorial. Uh, people in Gawler South put on a big effort to raise money for that, uh, that soldier down there on Adelaide Road. There's four buttons that were done as fundraisers. Now, there were two events, and I've grouped them together solely because I, I, it's hard to describe which buttons went to which event. So, the first one on the 12th of April um, said, the newspaper report said they had two designs of buttons. I don't know which two. Uh, the second one on the 8th of November, which was the one where Harry Butler did the flyover, um, described the buttons along with the memorial stone, and that was the only button on offer. But I would expect that probably all four were on offer. And there's no doubt in that one, but it leaves a fourth button, and I don't know where it fits in, this, in the scheme of the story. I suspect it may have been one that was on sale from their office, which was on Adelaide Road, um, all the time. And I suspect it was probably the first one, but I'm not certain. I'd really like to find you know, another unanswered question I'd like to solve. So that was those. Mm -hmm. And then the final button uh, for this particular talk is the next slide, which concerns the, the opening of or the unveiling of the memorial. So I did a special 45mm button for that one. And they were sold with commemorative postcards as well. And uh, the newspaper report only gives the combined sales value of £37 for buttons and postcards. And uh, the memorial there was uh, unveiled by Brigadier General Ling, who was then the Commissioner of Police, but he had a pretty impressive war service record before he, he did that particular job. So we'll close with uh, some of my references. The first little booklet up there is a really rare booklet. I had to go to the State Library to get a picture of one. It's only about 12 pages. I've never seen one in the market. Uh, a friend of mine's got a photocopy of one. He says he's been looking for one for 40 years. Never seen one. So it's a very rare little booklet. Uh, this jumble here, uh, I don't know how many people were avid antique uh, pursuers in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s as well. Or we remember Ron Harms' antique shop on Payton Road? Uh, Ron was a very strange man. <laughs> And his shop was literally one of those where everything was stacked up and he walked around his shop like that <laughs> because he didn't want to sell anything. <laughs> and we used to find out that if you wanted to buy something, you'd come with one lot that you wanted to buy in one hand and one lot that you wanted to buy in the other hand and basically say, I'm really interested in these. And he didn't make some excuse why he didn't want to sell them to me. He says, oh, all right, well, I have these instead. And that was the way to deal with Ron. Um, now, the... I would call the Experimental Arts Foundation at the time, which later became the Jam Factory. Uh, they actually photographed his collection and then basically just made photocopies of the photographs and produced three books. Three books. Uh, first book was on buttons, second book was on cardboard badges, and the third book was on metal badges. So, it, and those three books are really difficult to obtain today. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's got all three. I've got two of them and a photocopy of the third. Uh, but very worthwhile. No scholarship in it, just purely copies of what, what he had in his collection. Now, in recent times, somewhat prompted by the interest in uh, World War I centenary, uh, there is a renewed interest in collecting these. Uh, there's a chap in Victoria called Mark Taylor who uh, runs a Facebook group, and I think he's got a a website as well. He he's doing a database of buttons and he produces these books and he's done about 30 of them but they're all sort of buttons carved up in different ways. So the ones I've got here is uh, South Australia's World War One badges for 2021 edition. Peace, Victory and Repatriation badges. He's got another one for Red Cross badges. He's got another one for Legacy badges. And so it's about 30 altogether. About $35 each and they come out annually. So it's going to cost you a fortune to keep up with this, so I'm not attempting it because the Gawler ones are probably less than 2% of what's the content of those books, but uh, I'll leave them here to keep uh, The other book was one done for the Commonwealth Button Fund in, uh, in Melbourne, 
which once again there's a lot more scholarship in it um, in details of the buttons and how much they charge for them how many were made and how many were sold with that is known and all the details in those so all of those are starting to be produced now and uh, if you want an indication of how popular these buttons have come when i started collecting them you go into a second hand shop and there'd be a shoebox full of them 50 cents each take your pick now they start at 20 dollars each and go up um, and I've seen some of these buttons, like the one shilling ones, sort of being offered at figures around $75, and the more expensive ones just go to auction, and you pay what you need to, to get them. So, so that's that. So I thought that was an appropriate way to bracket the collection, just to concentrate on the World War One buttons, and uh, I think it's now it's probably time for me to uh, button my lip. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. It was a fascinating talk. I think it's um, amazing the stories that can be gained from such small historical objects, and you really brought those stories to life. I don't think any of us are going to look at buttons in quite the same way again, wondering if we've got special ones, rare ones, or um, ones that may be come um, historically important sometime down the future. So thank you on behalf of all of us for such a fascinating talk. <laughs>